divine presence, sacred geometry, and the legend of Agartha, a spiritual journey between history and mystery. The legend claims that somewhere in the depths of the earth, in dark caves and secret passages, there still lives one such sacred land inhabited by a secret, mysterious people, one hidden from the sight of others that is uh, known to only a few chosen ones on the surface, and that this knowledge is a strictly guarded secret. Or maybe it was until recently, this secret kingdom is called Agartha, this legend is ancient and comes from remote prehistory. Agartha is spoken of in legends of diverse peoples, white, red, yellow, in both east and west. Agartha is a kingdom hidden underground, populated by a people gifted with miraculous powers, a people that lives in wisdom and immense wealth. But Agartha is even more than that. It's the spiritual center of mankind ruled by a hidden ruler, the head of its in, in the initiated hierarchy, his title is King of the World. Now even the Emerald Tablets written by Thoth the Atlantean talk about an underworld kingdom. Uh, and I do have a playlist of the Emerald Tablets. It's worth you listening to it as you're exercising or doing things around the house or driving, whatever, because it's a great archaeological, uh, ancient technology, philosophy topic. Now, uh, ancient and uh, sacred geometry and the legend of Agartha. Tibet, Himalayas, 1933, the history of peoples is made by the unwritten history of great travels and world travelers, a history that began long before ancient Greek Herodotus or Marco Polo in the Neolithic or even earlier in some fantastical age of mankind perhaps even at the dusk of the primordial golden age, with glaciation or flood, and with the first in a series of catastrophes faced by the human species. Then followed eras of the migrations of people and races. If we believe Plato, then the Atlanteans were the first colonists of the world, and they came from the West. Others say that their ancestors were the Hyperboreans, who fled snow and ice in the far north of the continent. And over the course of subsequent history, peoples would move from north to south and from east to west, and not otherwise. This constitutes their course through history, a path of aging generation, and at times faster, at times slower, of an inexorable decline. This is how great conquests began, those that encompass immense regions, entire continents, and this is how great wars start, like the one that raged under the walls of Ilium, or was this only a shadow of some mythical war waged, waged in the far deeper past during the mythical age of the Earth? Perhaps at the beginning of time, in Ilo Tempore, they did not rush towards unknown and exotic lands, but towards their lost homelands, towards mythical lands of the beginning, towards the riches of the Golden Age towards primordial, Edenic abundance, towards paradise lost, such as a biblical one which we have not stopped searching for here on earth even today. One Islamic mystic, Surah Wardi, claimed that after death the soul returns to the homeland, for merciful Allah himself commanded this, and this would not be possible if he had not previously resided in it. This mythical homeland is to be found somewhere in the spiritual east, quote-unquote. In order to find the strength for this, we must start from the spiritual west, the western wells of exile. The true journey, true adventures of the spirit, this sheikh taught, start in the west. This is a place like a grave, a stockade of the burial place. Arriving on the soil of an unknown continent, Christopher Columbus thought he had discovered the new earth mentioned in the Apocalypse of St. John. The famous seafarer believed he was in the Gulf of Paria and in its fresh currents had discovered the origin of the four rivers of the lost heavenly garden, Eden itself. God made me the messenger of the new heaven and the new earth, of which he spoke in the Apocalypse of St. John, and before that through the mouth of Isaiah, Columbus proclaimed to King Juan, and he said, and he showed me the place where to find it. 
there is no single land, island, or continent in the world that is a mere geographical certainty. The whole earth is a sacred text, a holy book written in special signs, or at least that is what mystics and esoterics believe. The words of this text, it is thought, were written by God himself. Every journey is in fact a pilgrimage, for we're always walking on sacred ground. Every land and landscape, far and near, possesses hidden meaning and secret significance, spiritual, symbolic, eschatological, and even profoundly mystical. A landscape is at once both a physical and spiritual reality. This is the domain of a secret, mysterious science, mystical and sacred geometry, whose knowledge, as happens, has been lost forever over the course of centuries or millennia. The king of the world, legend claims that somewhere in the depths of the earth, in dark caves and secret passages, there still lives one such sacred land, inhabited by a secret mysterious people, one hidden from the sight of others, that is known to only a few chosen ones on the surface, and that this knowledge is a strictly guarded secret, or maybe it was until recently, and this secret kingdom is called Agartha. The legend is ancient and comes from remote prehistory. Agartha spoken of in legends of diverse people, both east and west, north and south. Agartha is a kingdom hidden underground, populated by a people gifted with miraculous powers, a people that lived in wisdom and immense wealth. But Agartha is even more than that. It's a spiritual center of mankind, ruled by a hidden leader, the head of its initiatic hierarchy. His title is the king of the world. Legend holds that this supreme spiritual metaphysical center of mankind, Agartha, has not always been hidden underground, nor will it stay there forever. This condition corresponds to the fallen state of humanity, the age of darkness and confusion, which it is said has lasted for the past 6,000 years. In 1890, the king of the world allegedly issued the following prophecy in the monastery of Narabanchi, quote, the time will come when the people of Agartha will come up from their subterranean caverns to the surface of the earth, end quote. Travelers who have set their minds to find it have whispered about it. Caravan merchants have told exhilarating tales of it in inns and mountain trails, in deserts and in remote corners. It's known to Tibetan sages whose teachings nourish monks and lamas. The common crowds, meanwhile, ridicule and laugh at such tales as the superstition of the uneducated and gullible. The tale of Agartha reached the West from two independent sources. In a book published posthumously in 1910, titled The Mission of India or The Mission of India in Europe, the French esotericist Saint-Yves d'Alverdere introduced the West to Agartha as a Buddhist myth of a secret center of the world hidden somewhere in the depths of the Himalayas, India, or Afghanistan. French esotericist René Guénon focused on Agartha as a spiritual center of the world in his 1927 book, The Lord of the World, reissued in 1983. Dalvedre account was commented upon by another French esotericist, the founding thinker of traditionalism, René Guénon. Traditionalist thought through the works of René Guénon provided an ex exegesis, an explanation that is, of this myth. At its deepest root is the idea of the supreme spiritual center, the spiritual center of humanity during the last time cycle of humanity, hence the Iron Age and the traditions of the people of the West. As Genon observed, numerous parallels and analogies of this Buddhist myth of the king of the world can be found across the most diverse traditions, from the Hindu and Jewish through the Islamic and Christian to the Celtic myth of the Holy Grail, which was subsequently super superficially Christianized. The very name, Agartha, or Agartha, Genon writes, means imperceptible and inaccessible, and also inviolable, since it is Salem, the abode of peace. But the name of the spiritual center before the present time cycle was Paradesha, supreme county, country in Sanskrit, whence a Chaldean Pardes or the Paradisus 
meaning paradise, paradisos, known to the Western traditions. Moreover, Genon drew a connection between Agartha and the light of the East of Islamic esotericism. Legendary Agartha, spoken of in the same breath as forgotten lands such as Hyperborea, two key figures helped bring the tale of Agartha to the West, French esotericist Saint-Yves d'Alvedre and the Polish travel author Ferdinand Osendowski. Absolute Pole, the light of the East is none other than the light of the North, the gold of the North, mentioned by classical writers. In other words, Agartha is only one of the many projects of the Pole, the North Pole, Hyperborea or Paradise, which has shifted over the course of history from the North to the West and from the South to the East. There exists, to name it, the Absolute Pole. Agartha is an Eastern projection of the Absolute Pole. We cannot seek this mystical pole above the surface of the earth at the top of Mount Meru, as it was in the Golden Age or in the Hyperborean cycle, but only underground, not in the polar ice of the Arctic, Arctic but in the east of the Eurasian continent. Emanuel Zwedenborg issued the mysterious pronouncement that in our age the lost world, quote-unquote, is to be found only among the wise men of Tatari and Tibet in the east. Sacred Geography and the Legend of Agartha, Spiritual Journey Between History and Mystery by Nicholas Rorick, 1942. Some authors claim that contact has been maintained with the center during almost all of the historical cycle of the West. This contact was at all times direct and realistic, but the final projection of the North Pole the sanctuary of the sacred king of the world in the East has become more and more inaccessible and mystified. It was interpreted only in the late historical times. Genon states that this happened soon after the Thirty Years' War, more precisely in 1648, when the real Rosicrucians, 12 in total, left Europe and withdrew to Asia to Agartha. The second Western source on Agartha was the Polish traveler and author Ferdinand Osendowski, who in his book Beasts, Men and Gods, published in 1924, reported on his tumultuous trip throughout Central Asia during the years 1921 and 22, there is a moment, Osendowski claims, when stillness overcomes the world, when wild animals stop in their run, horses stop to listen, birds stop flying, and travelers stop in their tracks, hordes of sheep and cattle and yaks crouch down to the ground, and dogs cease their barking. The wind subsides into a slow trembling of air, and the sun stops in its motion. For a moment, the whole world sinks into silence. An unfamiliar song penetrates the hearts of animals and people. This is the moment when the king of the world in Agartha speaks with God himself. Then tongues of flame in the letters of the Vatan alphabet erupt from his altar. Osendowski's account also received the commentary of Genon. Genon explains that Osendowski wrote the name of this underground kingdom as Agarti, whereas Yves Saint Dalvedere used the form Agartha, the latter being known to have been in contact with at least two Hindus. The fact that this mysterious legend from the East reached the peoples of the West in two different versions is explained by the fact that Alvedere was inspired by Hindu sources while Olsendowski was influenced by Lamaist from the, the Lamas uh, of the Himalayas. The accounts of Dalvader, Olsendowski, and Genon do not, however, exhaust the traces and hints of Agartha. A book published in the 17th century in Leiden mentions the city by the name of Agartus Opidum, reportedly located in the Nile Delta of Egypt. This fact was unknown to Genon. Lucius Ampelius, a Latin author from the 3rd century, claimed that the city stood a statue, in the city stood a statue with hands of ivory and a bright emerald on its brow. This statue, it is written, incites panic and fear among animals and people, and especially among barbarians. The word oppidum in Latin means elevation, fort, or hill. The meaning of the word agartus is unknown and has no meaning in Latin. 
It's also recorded that long ago in Media, that's today's Persia, near the southern coast of the Caspian Sea stood a city called Asagarta. Ptolemy added that the inhabitants of this land call themselves Sagartians, and Herodotus of ancient Greece claimed that 8,000 Sagartians, inhabitants of this lost land, were present in the army of the Persian, present, uh, Persian king Darius. Asgard, the mythical city of the Aesir, was the capital of the Samartians and Roxalana. Some researchers equate Asgard as Agartha. Others think that Agartha was actually that city mentioned by the Roman Lucius as lying on the banks of the Nile. This is a mistake, the very same mistake committed by some in regards to Atlantis or Thule. Agartha is in fact Thule, or rather one in a chain of Thules which appear at different times in different meridians. The same is true of its mysterious inhabitants, who at times come out onto the surface of the earth. Thus the name Agartha has been known since ancient times, since the very beginning of history, and it can be found everywhere, from ancient Egypt to Bactria, in its projections, in its representations on earth, in its secondary variations, just as Thule, including even Atlantis, is only a projection of the primordial and original Hyperborean Thule, the one erected by the hands of man-gods at the dawn of time. Agartha and America? The fact that all the known names of sacred geographical centers corresponding to cosmic cycles and events, Hyperborea, Thule, Atlantis, etc., come up in investigations of Agartha, and that this is happening in the modern age, especially since the discovery of America, is no coincidence. If the discovery of America, or rather the return of America to history, triggered such unrest among people, then what will happen if the prophecy of the end of the world is fulfilled and the secret Agartha becomes known to, uh, to all of humanity? It's prophesied that the people of Agartha will once more come out onto the surface of the earth, and likewise paradise, the Garden of Eden, is hidden somewhere in the east. It's in the east of the wise sages. Tartary, Swedenborg claims that we should search for the long forgotten world. What is the link between Agartha and America? Is it the same thread that interconnects all continents? Could their appearance, or rather reappearance, on the horizon of world history represent a sign that the final times, the end times, the secret of America was known to the Vikings, the Egyptians, the Phoenicians, in the ancient Greeks, and even uh, thousands of years before the Portuguese and Spanish seafarers? Esot Esotericists and the adepts of secret societies, mystics and conjurers, astrologers and neophytes, the followers of secret cults and obscure conspirators, all are still weaving their dark webs around Agartha and the deep mysteries that hide this underground kingdom. America is not only the land of the apocalypse, a story that speaks about the end of the world and the last revelation. The first newcomers identified America with paradise, where even the trees and plants spoke the hieroglyphic language of our Adamic or primitive states. The new world was for them a projection of paradise on earth by which God baptized his chosen people, the new Israel. Others identify America on no lesser grounds with Atlantis, whose downfall was described by Plato. Failing to observe that the Greek philosopher was precise in the details he gave and that besides the island of Atlantis, he also mentions a land in the west surrounded by oceans on all sides. This, there can be no doubt, is the North America continent. America is only its shadow, its projection in the far west, the false Atlantis. America is, of course, not the mythical island of Atlantis, but that vanished in the Atlantic Ocean at the very dawn of history. It is actually the green land, the land of the dead, the kingdom of shadows in the west, that is mentioned in the legends and myths of many people. America is transatlantis. What is the meaning of the reappearance of the dead sunken continent on the horizon of world history? In the same way, Agartha is also a land of the dead, which as prophecy holds is still to be discovered in the depths of the underground. 
The, in historical times, this reportedly was realized by some travelers and seekers. One of them was the Mongolian hunter who could not keep his, this secret and thus had his tongue cut out by llamas. The Lama Jam Srap spoke of this in his book. Another was an illiterate Norwegian sailor who claimed to have lived in Agartha for several years. The reader will see that these fleeting mentions are not without grounds and that America and Atlantis are closely connected without the topic of Agartha. The mysterious kingdom hidden in the everlasting dark, deep underground and deep in the past. It's closely connected with the worlds of the dead and the past, with the past that refuses to die, and it verily conceals many secret histories of the human race. And yet, the idea of an underground hiding place of the incarnation of the sacred celestial principle is in itself contradictory. According to sacred knowledge, logic, the seats of spiritual authority are to be found in mountains, not in the underworld which is logically and naturally connected with the thonic, that is the underground uh, beings, the infernal and the hellish. Moreover, archetypes and ideas, ideas themselves choose their bearers throughout history, and it's not always possible to accurately distinguish between real and symbolic continents. Lands and cities mentioned in sacred texts from the Vedas to the Bible, in sacred texts from the Vedas to the Bible, in sacred texts, the sacred and earthly planes, physical and sacred geography, physical and metaphysics, physics and metaphysics constantly intersect. But above all, these fabulous lads are not the product of mere fantasy. Rather, the matter is one of a fragile memory for which it is still necessary to find the appropriate keys. In this sense, and according to this logic, the light of the north or light of the east Indeed, the light of Agartha is not strictly localizable on the territorial plane. Likewise, journeys to and accounts of Agartha are not only or not mainly travels in geography and history, but travels of the spirit, travels whose interior center is that within man. As the Chandoga Upanishad says, now the light which shines higher than this heaven on the backs of all, on the backs of everything, is the highest worlds than which there are no higher. Verily, that is the same as the light, this light which is here within a person. The chains of Agarthas lead along and are the chains of spiritual journey. In journeying to Agartha, we are traveling into the light of myth. A reawakening of myth is a reawakening of that hidden, mysterious inner light within ourselves. In this dimension, lost and found, lands, islands, continents, and kingdoms like Agartha have sometimes uh, something to tell us that is quite different from the pos positive geographical discovery and research of recent history. Boris Nad is a Serbian thinker, writer of diverse genre, author of more than a dozen books on matters spiritual and geopolitical. His works on the world of myth and mythology range from a philosophical essay to novel, short stories, various poems, poetry, and prose. Nad's geopolitical analysis are regularly published in Serbian international media. And this is on Out of Minds 2 by Boris Nad. Please leave your comments and thank you for your support. This is from New Dawn magazine. Thank you. Kindly support my Patreon account. The daily posts are five videos daily, and they are totally different from what I have on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support, and that you find all my content so interesting. You'll find the Patreon account details in the description box.